This is the Seller Process Podcast, where we talk about the best systems, processes, and SOPs for your Amazon business so that you can regain control of your time, build up your team, and scale your e-com empire. Hello, entrepreneurs. If you are building your brand on Amazon and looking to optimize your business and operations to maximize the value of your company, to potentially sell it in the future for a big cash out, then this episode is for you. Our guest today will share with us a pre-exit checklist, a list of powerful questions you will need to ask yourself to fully optimize your business in preparation of the sale. I'm joined today by John Elder, who currently runs Black Label Advisor, an Amazon-centric consultancy focused solely on helping sellers and brand owners expand their reach on the platform and grow their business. Clients come to John from all over the world to for, for advice ranging from listing audits to solving logistical issues. And if your business needs an extra set of eyes, Black Label Advisor can deliver. Hey, John, welcome to the show. Good morning. Well, I guess it's good evening there. It's great to be on the show. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, good to see you again. Uh, so as as I just mentioned, you know, you're we're going to talk about this checklist, this pre-exit checklist, which uh, people from, you know, the, that are uh, used to listen to this podcast know that in every episode, we have a complementary material uh, that we share with the audience that so that, you know, they can uh, use it uh, by themselves in their business. So in this case, we, we are, we're going to share with them this pre-exit checklist, which uh, guys you can find uh, in the episode show notes at the sellerprocess.com. In the, uh, in this episode, you will find a download button or in the description of the YouTube video. Okay, John. So let's let's start to dive into this checklist. So I'd like to ask you first: uh, uh, At what point should seller sellers ask themselves the questions that you provided in this uh, in this list and uh, yeah. how do we know when is the right time to sell yeah you know exiting is one of those things that um really people just don't talk about it so you know that's why that's why exiting is naturally really messy especially for amazon sellers because there's not a lot of people out there that are guiding people so that's that's a huge part of what I do. A black label advisor is helping people, you know, boost their multiples, get their business cleaned up and exit properly. So, you know, a checklist is something that you should be thinking about years in advance of an exit. This isn't something that you just wake up and say, Oh, I'm going to exit in six months. Um, it's a multi-year process and, you know, a best case scenario, you want to be thinking about your exit strategy from day one. And, and I know that there's a little bit of like pushback against that type of thinking that, you know, you shouldn't be building up your business to exit. You know, if you watch Shark Tank, you'll hear a lot of that. But honestly, it's a bunch of nonsense because vast majority of people are growing their business. Yes. Are they passionate about their brands? Yes. But at the same time, everyone would love a five, seven, ten million dollar exit. So um, thinking about that from day one is extremely important and it really guides a lot of your business decisions. So it's going to reduce the amount of risk that you take. Um, it's going to help you, um, stay really lean in your business. It's going to help you, um, you know, stay really focused on staffing, you know, instead of being really bloated with staffing, like a lot of aggregators are right now, um, you know, you're, you're going to kind of naturally be prone to uh, running leaner. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of good that comes from running your business to exit someday. So really to answer that question, it, it's best case, think about it from day one of your first product launch. Um, and then if you're, you know, for brands that, you know, maybe, maybe that was never the intent in the beginning, but things have changed now and you want to grow to exit your business, um, you know, give yourself two years. Um, that's going to give yourself, you know, uh, plenty of time to go. We're going to probably cover a lot of, a lot of the checklist today, but it's going to give you time to get everything cleaned up and get optimized for the highest multiple possible. And that's really the goal here is getting your business um, streamlined in a way that is extremely attractive to the market. So none of the stuff you should ever rush. You know, these are all very methodical steps. 
And so, you know, it, it just takes time naturally. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what I wanted to hear from you because uh, I just wanted to give people this mindset that they should think of pre of the preparation to the sale like from day one. Because uh, I guess most people are thinking, okay, that's that's too early. It's not you know it's not relevant to me because maybe yeah. who knows I'm going to sell in uh, in two in two years, three years, and so on. But actually, the preparation starts now because uh, you you need to put in place the foundation in order to, for you to uh, to yeah. And, and I'll just I'll just give. I'll just give some practical story here. You know, I, so my background's construction management. Um, you know, I thought I was going to do that the rest of my life. And so I'm building something on the side, but from day one on my vision board, it, you know, I call it a vision board, it's just a big whiteboard. I had a goal number and that goal number was a very specific exit number, you know, years down the road. And so from day one of, you know, launching my first product in the sporting goods category, you know, that was something I was going to attain someday. That was a long-term vision goal. And it's too few people build to exit. And a lot of people, you know, kind of get into a position where they're like, oh my gosh, if I could go back, you know, two, three years and make different decisions, I would have a much higher multiple because it's more attractive to the market. And so if you can, if you can get your mindset, you know, just really focus on what are buyers actually looking for and what's going to make me the most money at, at exit. Um, that's, that's really key. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love how you put it because, uh, you know, this, this checklist is also like a way to minimize regrets, you know, a lot, uh, after a while. Right. So, um, absolutely. we might, as you mentioned, you know, most people regret not to have done the right moves when it was the right time and uh, now they're regretting that you know uh th they're not getting the, the multiple that they were, they were looking for so definitely yeah. this is the way to go start early and uh, that's what what we're going to do now let's start let's dive in into this uh checklist let's try to cover as many questions as possible and you guys know that you can always access this checklist uh, by downloading it from the website right so let let's let's move on john uh, uh, start with uh, questions that you feel it's more relevant, but let's try to cover as many as possible. Yeah, I mean, so one of the one of the one of the biggest ones is uh, IP protection. So you know, when a buyer is looking at your business, you know, they're really thinking about how how am I how am I protected from Chinese sellers? How am I protected from your competition? And so, you know, if you don't have any protection whatsoever in terms of design patents, trademarks, things like that that naturally the multiple is going to be lower. So the more sophisticated you are as a seller, the more IP protection you have as a seller, the more assurances you can provide a buyer, uh, the higher your multiple is going to be. And uh, there's no like easy math for this. It's a very kind of, um, it's multiple, it's multiple things all combined into one multiple. So it, it, you can't say like, okay, I have the strong IP protection. So it gets me like a 5% bump on a, on a multiple. Every buyer is going to be different. Every aggregator is going to be different. The fact of the matter is it just naturally your multiple is going to be higher because what they're doing is when buyers are looking at, you know, potential FBA businesses, they're, they're comparing you to others. Okay. They don't have a lot of emotion with this stuff. So they're viewing it on, on paper. And so if they're looking at, you know, 10 potential FBA businesses and maybe um, they're looking at maybe a sporting sporting goods, uh, maybe they're looking at, uh, you know, car tools, uh, maybe they're looking at makeup category and they're looking at the different things and there's one business and maybe that's yours and it stands out because you've gone out of your way to protect your top sellers with design patents and no one else is allowed to sell that specific design on Amazon or in America. And, and the rest of the, the sellers, you know, the, the other businesses they're looking at don't have that IP protection. So what are they going to do? They're going to be very attractive to your business and they're going to bump up their multiple to secure the deal. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the whole goal here is to bump up that multiple. Yeah, absolutely. One one question that uh, comes to my mind about this is, you know, most people have, um, I mean, if, if they're 
if they have planned well uh, enough to in, during their product development phase in, to create a very unique product, then of course they will be able to uh, patent their design or protect that specific product, right? But let's talk about the majority of, of sellers. Most of them, they don't have a very unique product, right? So there is really not too much chance to protect that design or IP or make a patent or so on and so on. But what I, I learned is that, um, you know, you know, the, what we have in our power is for example, you know, uh, using trademarks for, uh, the brand and yeah. uh, copywriting images, for example. Right. So, uh, would you suggest to, to even if you are selling in one country or just a few, a few countries on Amazon, would you suggest people to register their their trademark, you know, in as many countries as possible, just to get that kind of, you know, extra IP? Uh, yeah. yeah. Or yeah, what's your take on yeah, that? Absolutely. So, kind of the strategy there is it's kind of a it's kind of a question of like how much is it worth it to you? Okay. So, you know, if you are doing you know 05 percent of your total sales for a business in Portugal, for example, you know you're not you're not going to like really worry about getting your trademark registered there mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. if you are absolutely killing it in the UK then it makes sense because you know to file these things in different countries you know whether it's Australia Japan or or the EU you know it's going to take money with a lawyer and so you know it, it takes time and effort and and capital so you have to just ask yourself how worth it, how much, you know, is it, is it going to be worth it to register your trademark there? Um, so, you know, kind of like, it makes sense. You know, if you look at the numbers perspective, it makes sense to register in, uh, in the EU and in the UK and another place, a lot of people neglect, and it's not for revenue potential, but it's more for port protection. And so, you know, registering your trademark in China is actually a really good idea. So it's, it's kind of a nightmare scenario. Um, let's say you are, you know, running your business for three years, you have a booming brand. Um, all of a sudden, a black hat seller registers your trademark in China. And then now they have total control of uh, stopping your inventory from leaving the country. So that's kind of a, a really bad situation. Um, it's better to it's better to have that protection just because um, it's it's really not that much more money to register there, but at least you have uh, that trademark there in China or whatever whatever you know whichever country you're sourcing from. It's good to have that protection to make sure you know a competitor can't hijack your brand and prevent you from you know <laughs> shipping out your goods. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, you just, you just have to ask yourself, you know, it, is it worth it to you? Um, and, and, you know, the numbers will speak to you, you know, some people do really well in places like Australia and, 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 and most people don't, um, same thing with Canada and Mexico. So you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, where's the bulk of my revenue happening outside of the U S and then make a decision on what are, where, where to re register those trademarks. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, that's great advice, actually. Yeah, I didn't thought about, I uh, didn't think about uh, registering in China as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, it's good advice. It's going to hire the multiple, uh, hopefully. I mean, it's it's one piece of that. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's, we, we covered a lot actually here in the IP protection. Let's let's move on with uh, uh, more questions. Like, uh, what are the few other questions that it's a must uh, to uh, to increase our multiples? So, you know, the, another one that's really important is maintaining growth rate during negotiations and, and, and contracts. So, you know, a huge mistake that people make uh, is listing your business for sale. We'll just call it January 1st and time goes by and you start getting lazy with your business. Uh, may, maybe, maybe the numbers looked good, you know, for the previous, like when you listed your business, but now your revenue is plummeting. Um, that's going to show up uh, during due diligence. Uh, the bank is going to have major concerns for that as well. So that not only you know has the potential to you know reduce your multiple, but it also has the potential to kill the deal. And so 
you know, that period, um, you know, you might be listed on, you know, in the market for three months and then negotiations are three months. Um, so that's a pretty long period for an FBA seller. Uh, but the key is to, during that time, really just ensure you don't have stockouts, ensure that you are maintaining that 50 to 100% year over year growth and, um, and really just run your business as if you're not exiting. The, it, and that's really hard to do because there's the, there's the golden carrot, you know, at the end of the road and you're like, oh, it's this huge payday and it's almost guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed until that hits your checking account. So it's really important to stay focused and run your business and, and, and not to stop launching products as well. And that will, that will ensure that you, you know, not only hit your multiple, but um, you know, that the buyer is still interested. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's great advice. And I think some of the some people I hear uh, saying is that uh, you actually they suggest to be more conservative in the in the last year in 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 you know in the twelve months prior to the sale because uh, to, not to you know uh, make any expensive mistakes that could you know uh, hinder the the, the business. But oh, yeah, you, no, you're I'm saying to, to still kind of keep launching products. So what's your take on that? Um, and you, you need to be launching products, like, like, but do it sustainably, you know, be really smart. Like you said, be really conservative. So for example, you know, use your existing product listings to your benefit. Okay. So instead of launching a bunch of new products and starting in zero reviews, launch new variations. So if you have, you know, a um, fantastic kitchen product and it comes in the color gray, white, and black, well, maybe look at launching blue and green as color variations for that. So that's a really, really easy way to naturally grow your business. Um, at the same time, doing it with a, as little risk as possible, because you've already proven the concept um, it launching new colors is, is kind of a slam dunk strategy anyways, uh, for any FBA seller, but you know, that, allow, that allows you to be in a position of perpetual growth, uh, during that phase of listing, you know, between listing your business and the actual exit. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Cool. Uh, so your benchmarks are 50 to hundred percent year on year growth. That's kind of what we should be focusing in. Yeah. And you know, it, it's, um, it's definitely harder to do that right now. We have global cooling, you know, e-commerce has been hit pretty hard. So, you know, I, that's why I put it at 50%. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just really hard to main, to hit that hundred percent right now, you know, unless you have a lot of extended, extended, uh, capital and lending, but, um, that's really what buyers are looking for. They want to see that consistent year over year growth. That chart should be beautiful. It should be going up. And, you know, it's just one of those things you have to be thinking about, you know, put yourself in the shoes of someone who's going to give you, you know, five, seven, ten million dollars at exit. Um, you know, do they want a business that has plummeting year over year growth or negative growth? No, they want to see consistent growth. Yeah. Um, so maybe one year you had 25 percent, but, you know, the rest of the years are 50 for 50 percent plus. Um, they just want to see that consistency. So that's really key. Got it. Got it. Cool. Okay. Let's move on. What, what else, what, what's, what else is in the, in the checklist? So, you know, something that's changed a lot is there's this massive shift to, okay, that's great. You have this beautiful FBA business, but we want to see uh, some diversity. And so the question is, is like, oh shoot, what is, what does diversity look like? You know, diversity of, of revenue. So, you know, that looks like a fully built out Shopify site and just, you know, building out your customer base there uh, across social media platforms, uh, you know, be having a presence on Walmart and, you know, having, you know, a revenue split of, you know, right now the desirable split is 80, 20, and that's really, really hard to accomplish, especially since Amazon controls over half of all digital sales in America. But, um, buyers are really interested in you if you can prove that you not only have carved out authority on Amazon, but have carved out authority on Shopify. So Shopify attracts people who are very anti-Amazon. So, you know, they want to see some diversity there. So they want, they want to see pretty much, they want to see that you did the dirty work and you proved yourself on Shopify and social media. And 
they want to go take that and build it up even higher. So, you know, but, but you really, honestly, you did the hard work. So they want to come in and swoop you up and, you know, they want to make sure that, you know, that's, that's proven. And so you need to show that through um, uh, the revenue that you're doing on Shopify. Got it. Okay. Interesting. So you're saying Shopify over Walmart, is it, is it better? Uh, it's not necessarily better. Shopify um, gives you full access to your customers, which they're really interested. It actually ties into our next uh, checklist item. So that's your email list. That email list is literally gold. So think about how many emails you get from, you know, we'll just use um, Express or any other um, uh, clothing retailer. You're probably getting an email you know, once a day from those companies or once every two days. And so they're blasting out new designs. They're blasting out uh, special deals. And so that's, that's a huge source of revenue for off Amazon. So that's, that's where buyer, that's what buyers want to see. They want to see a fully built out Shopify site with a strong email list and a strong social media following. So they can come in and say, okay, we're going to ramp up social media and, you know, they already have a tribe and a cult following. And we want to exploit that and get people talking about our brand uh, off Amazon. So uh, on Walmart, you don't really don't get a lot of access to customer data as well. Uh, Walmart is just another, they're kind of really the only, if you look at the grand scheme of things, they're the only competitor to Amazon right now. So, you know, that's just a matter of being diverse with where your traffic's coming from. But if you can be dominant on Amazon and Walmart and Shopify, that's kind of like the, 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 the trifecta right now, the buyers are looking for. Mm, okay. Interesting. Cool. Okay. What's, what else is in the list? Uh, so we covered the, uh, the newsletter. That's really, really important, especially for, um, you know, deals, you know, whether it's Father's Day or Christmas. Um, you know, your tribe, these are, these are people who have really placed a lot of trust in your brand and they're actually interested in your brand story. So there's a lot of people on Amazon who they're just, they're, they're just buying things because your pictures are awesome and, and it's a really good price, but the people on Shopify, they're really interested in who you are as a brand and you can really deliver on that through your newsletter. So, you know, for that, uh, make sure you're doing like a 70, 30 split, 70% of the time you're doing promos and 30% of the time you're doing, uh, organic content. Uh, for example, um, you know, uh, if you, um, are a clothing retailer or a clothing brand and, um, you know, you're doing a lot of promos and saying, you know, here's a special deal. This is a new design for maybe some jeans, uh, and organic content would be, Hey, we, we partnered up with this charity. Um, so we're doing a special event, come see us at the booth, uh, things like that. So just think kind of outside the box to create, um, something truly unique for your brand. Um, and then, you know, going into the next one is really, we're kind of like going a little deeper in the weeds, but it's a really good question. Ask yourself, you know, do you have any one single product that's doing uh, more than 10% of your revenue? So, um, if the answer is yes, you want, you want to obviously change that. And the reason why is that's extreme risk. So let's say you have a hero product on Amazon and it's doing 20% of your revenue. Um, you know, no one knows the future. So if you have a product that controls that much of your business and, you know, the buyer purchases your business. And then the very next week, you, they get a barrage of Chinese sellers and you get wiped out. But there goes 20% of your business. So, you know, you want to make sure that you have a variety of uh, products under your brand's catalog and to make sure that you're spread uh, re just really nicely and even across uh, your different product lines. Okay. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Uh, I think we have time for like one or two more questions. What would be yeah. the, um, the most important ones that we should mention? Um, you know, buyers are absolutely obsessed with staffing and what, what it takes to manage your business. So you need to make this as easy as possible. So when they ask, you know, are you, are you going to be transferring over the staff? for your business? The answer should be yes. So typically, you know, for, for vast majority of FBA sellers, they have a team of VAs, uh, typically from the Philippines. So, you know, yes, the answer is 
you know, to them, they're going to come over to your business. They're going to transfer over, you know, after the exit and they're going to start working for you. And, you know, you need to have the vast majority of your business enterprise outsourced. So whether that's PPC management, that should be done by an agency. That's a really easy handoff. New owner, agency is unchanged. Okay. So, you know, if they're looking at, okay, who's managing your logistics, that should be your VA. So your VA is someone who should be managing uh, the C shipments, uh, talking with the freight forwarder. Um, those are those aren't things. Those are things obviously you want to be CC'd on on email, but you don't need to be getting into the weeds with that stuff. Your employee should be dealing with that stuff. So a buyer really wants to see a lean enterprise for your business, uh, and you know it comes down to all also like the time investment they don't want to buy a business and then it works 60 hours a week on your business they want a business where they're working 15 20 hours a week and everything else is outsourced so the more you have everything optimized and the more attractive uh you make your business um the higher the multiple is going to be so this is a question that comes up a lot during exits and uh you know they a lot of buyers will actually get very specific with uh, the number of hours that you're working and how you're staffing um, uh, for all of your tasks. Mm, okay, that's interesting. But I'm curious, uh, the aggregators specifically, they do have their own staff, right? So that's yeah. uh, something that is more relevant maybe for like individual buyers or small companies or or also aggregators will want to hire your team. Yeah, I know aggregators are probably not going to use your team. Some of this stuff, they probably will use your VAs. Uh, but the vast majority of exits are actually not with aggregators. So at most businesses are sold to private buyers or private equity firms, uh, not to aggregators. Aggregators are kind of like a kind of like a um a newer concept in the last couple of years. Um historically, uh, most uh, most of the time it's a serial entrepreneur. Um, or it could be a mom and pop type company where, you know, they're like, okay, we want to go buy this Amazon business. That's, that's actually most of the time, that's what it is. Um, so, you know, when I exited in late 2019, um, you know, of course I talked to the entire market. Uh, so I'm using a broker, um, but I sold to a private buyer. So he was a serial entrepreneur and actually had to train him from scratch, um, how to run Amazon, how to run the business. Uh, but that's actually the most common story. And that's that question is really important for a private buyer versus an aggregator, because you're right, an aggregator has internal staff. So that's kind of a different, uh, different okay. issue. Okay, okay, that's great. All right. So we covered, I think, the most important questions. And uh, I remind you guys that you can download this checklist at the sellerprocess.com in the in the show notes of this episode or in the description of the youtube video okay and uh, john uh, just to conclude if you uh, if people are looking for for help how can you how can you help them and how can they reach out to you yeah uh, most people actually reach out through twitter so i have a um, i have a calendar link um, where you can book a, a free discovery call uh, people um, have actually been booking a ton of those calls, but if you go to, um, I don't know if you're going to include my my uh, uh, yes my handle for Twitter, yeah. Um, so you can publish that, but it's a uh, black label ADVSR uh, for advisor. Um, and then if you go to my website, that's another place a lot of people uh, reach out to me. Um, there, I have a little contact form there. Um, you can just put some info on, you know, what are those you know big issues that you're trying to tackle. Uh, and then my website is blacklabeladvisor.com. So, um, you know, either of those places are great. Um, and the real key thing is just to get into a, into a uh, book and intro call um, is just to see if we're a good fit. So, you know, really, you know, I'm working with people um, ranging from brand new sellers to eight figure brands who um, are trying to position themselves for an exit. Um, and so, you know, my job is to help, um, you know, each client along the way and, and to avoid those catastrophic mistakes that a lot of people make. Okay. That's great. Sounds good, John. Thank you again for, for this interview. 
And guys, remember the key to success is to emulate the best. So go download this checklist, take action on the tips that John just shared and uh, try to build your business according to, to, this, uh, to, to these best practices to one day sell, sell it uh, for, a, for a big cash out. So John, it was a great a pleasure to have you here. I hope to see you in the next episode. Absolutely. It was great to be on. Thank you. Hey, entrepreneurs. I hope you enjoyed the episode and learned something from the interview. If you're serious about creating systems for your business, automating processes and building up your team so that you can transfer the tedious daily tasks in order to focus on more high level strategic tasks and work on your business and not in your business. I've created a guide for Amazon sellers named Capturing Systems and Creating SOPs that you can find at thesellerprocess.com slash systems ebook, where you will learn how to leverage systems and SOPs in your Amazon business so that you can accomplish more by working less, optimize your time, automate and delegate tasks, and reap the benefits of being a true business owner and not simply an operator in your own business. Go download the ebook at thesellerprocess.com slash systems ebook and start implementing all the tips and insights that I share with you. And leave us a review or a comment to let us know how, how the content we are sharing here is making an impact in your business. And have a productive week.